snowing outside. I didn't know if you knew that. I just saw it in the windows. But it is still a good day to praise the Lord. It is good to have you guys here. Let's go ahead and come on in. Stand with me. We're going to take our hymnals 527 this morning. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Glory to his name. Number 527. Lift it up with us this morning. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where from cleansing from sin I on that third. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Please remain standing. We'll open in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of coming to your house this morning to learn more about you. We just ask you to be with the services to follow, be with the singing, be with the message, help it to open our hearts, to be able to receive and be a blessing to us and bring us closer to you. We ask this now in your precious name. Amen. You all may be seated. you believe how much they're pushing the marriage retreat this year? I know. I understand why it is important for people such as James and Becky's age, but for people our age, I don't have, if I don't have you trained by now, there isn't much hope for you. <laughs> trained? I have you know I let you do things for me so you'll feel needed, just like your brother taught me. And by the way, you sh the uh, announcement should be made in young married, you know, Sunday school class anyway. I mean, why are they doing this in front of the whole church? You know, it's a little insulting that they think we still need to work on our relationship at this point. It's really second nature to us, don't you think? Absolutely. I have the eye roll and the flick of the head down pat. <laughs> And you have mastered the art of selective hearing quite well. <laughs> we have worked on our marriage for years. What could a young preacher and his wife have to tell us? We still remember how to let our hair down and have fun. Mm, well, at least some of us. <laughs> well, I have you know, I hear perfectly. I do turn the lights mm -hmm. off. And it doesn't take me very long to wash or comb my hair, not like some people. We won't mention your name. <laughs> Besides, there are only so many people that God is proud of, and the rest of me put hair on. <laughs> but the Bible does tell us in 2 Timothy 3.14, But continue thou in the things 
thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing whom thou hast learned them. We are not supposed to be satisfied with our spiritual lives. and There is always more to learn and further to grow. You know that is really true of our marriage relationship too. I guess you're right, as usual. Maybe it would be a blessing for the younger couples to see how a God-centered marriage works even as you grow older to get you through some of the most difficult times in the tragic events of our life recently. I definitely don't want to take advantage of our relationship. You are never too old to enrich your marriage. I hope we can be an encouragement to people to join us on our couples retreat March 3rd and 4th. Yes, that is the first weekend of March, and the $50 deposit is next week. Um, if you haven't signed up, the sign-up is in the back. Uh, we'd love to have you guys this week or this year. Um, I know, like we they just mentioned, Brother James, Miss Becky need it. I'm sure Larry and Mary might need it also, and you might need it. So um, please be aware of that. Uh, sign up, and we'd love to have you guys. Go ahead and stand. Let's look at another song this morning. This is 188 in your hymnals, At the Cross, At the Cross. Lift it up with us this morning. If you need those words, it's 188. Alas, and did my Savior plead and did my sovereign die? Would he be pulled that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart. at this time good morning welcome to cornerstone uh we have a few annou announcements real quick first of all pastors as you guys know isn't here this week um him and wilma are doing very good uh brother james told me that wilma walked down seven flights of stairs and up one flight of stairs so she's improving in her health doing better um next week Brother Vosberger is going to be here preaching. He's going to be preaching all day, and the topic is going to be social media. So, if, so that's a great topic. About everyone has that involved in their lives right now. So that'll be a good topic um, to to learn about. I'm, I'm looking forward to it next week. Um, and right now, uh, Brother or Steve Dewitt and Tanya, they have some announcements they're going to make as well. So I'll go ahead and have them come up. Hopefully you have um, seen the purple box that's in the foyer. There is um, a donation box for Charity Jertberg, our missionary to Madagascar. Um, she is battling cancer right now as, being, as well as being pregnant for her fifth child. And she, um, after her fourth, she didn't think she was going to have any more. So she got rid of all her baby things. And I asked her what she had, and she pretty much has a blanket. So um, I was thinking what we could do to be a blessing to her with all the struggles she is going through right now. 
and um, the, really the best way, because she is not sure exactly where she will be delivering the baby at right now, will be uh, gift cards. So um, I just ask that you um, please be a blessing to her. She could really use mostly our prayers right now, but also encouragement. It would just be awesome if she could get um, a good amount of money right now. So those are just a few things that would be nice. She didn't have to worry about um, what she gets over there is baby expenses. So um, if you could, um, we're requesting um, Walmart or Amazon.com, but if you've got cash, go ahead and just throw it right in there. So if you could um, be a blessing, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. I am excited to announce um, we have an activity coming up for the men in the church. Um, it is called the Outdoorsman Wild Game Potluck and Chili Dinner. And I know um, we don't have a ton of outdoorsmen in the church, uh, like diehard outdoorsmen, but that's okay. Uh, you don't have to be an, a diehard outdoorsman. Um, if you like to hunt or fish or shoot or be in the outdoors, that helps. But even if you're a guy, uh, you can just come on out. Um, it's The whole point of it is outreach to, to share the gospel with people. So. If you have unsaved friends and family who are interested in the outdoors, um, this is a great chance to invite them. Um, it's going to be Saturday, March 11th, 6 to 9 o'clock. We're bringing in a, a special speaker. He's a, an avid bow hunter um, and a big fisherman. He's going to be speaking. We're going to be doing some um, door prizes, playing some games, uh, doing some other stuff. Uh, we're going to have some mini seminars. Mr. Ridenauer is going to talk about tube fishing for smallmouth um, and a couple other people talking about some stuff. So it should be a great time. Um, if you have some deer, rabbit, squirrel, wild boar, goose, duck, you name it, maybe some raccoon or something like that, uh, if you do that kind of thing, uh, bring it in, have some fish, bring it in. If you don't have that, um, um, we're encouraging you to bring in a pot of chili. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table back there for you to say, you know, put your name down, how many people you think uh, you have coming and what you're going to bring. Uh, we're not going to hold you to that. Um, you don't have to pay or anything like that. There's no tickets or anything like that. Um, so invite your friends, invite your family. It should be a great time of uh, fellowship for outdoorsmen. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please just feel free to ask me, and uh, we'll get it straightened out. So thank you very much. Next, I'm going to have Brother Joe Asbury come on up, and he's here for the will and estate planning. Um, this af after the service, he'll be set up at the information desk so that you can schedule an appointment tomorrow. And all the appointments will be either in Brother Salazar's office or Pastor's office. So I'll have him come and talk about that. Okay, thank you very much. Most of you know who I am. I come around about once a year and do a little bit of follow-up. Uh, if any of you that I've met with before need to come back and see me, come by and set up an appointment. What I do is help people in the area of wills, estate planning, living trust, powers of attorney, and all the things that help you to be a good steward to set your affairs in order. Uh, for those of you younger, it's time to get started when you have children. Um, guardianship of your children. If you're killed in an accident, who would raise your children? Where would they go to church? Where would they go to school? This is very important. You need to have a legal document naming whom you want. It's not a verbal commitment. It's not a family understanding. It's a legal document naming whom you want to be the guardian of your children. Materially, most of us don't have much. Usually the people I meet with, just mom, dad, house, car, and kids, and a uh, few things God's given us. But we want to be good stewards. We don't want a bunch of strangers walking away with it. And uh, what I do, now I'm not an attorney, I'm a preacher, but I've been doing this 40 years now. But I show people how to protect and preserve their property, how to keep the courts, the attorneys out of it. So when you die, it can just move over to your kids. Very little expenses, if any. Uh, very short time, uh, and so on. Another document that's very important are powers of attorney for business and health care. Uh, I've had... Uh, 
over the years, I've had numerous people talk about what happened in their family. One in Oklahoma cost them $4,000, one another one $5,000. Uh, a man in Florida wanted to sell his house and move to another state. His wife had dementia. She couldn't sell the house, cost him $3,500 just to go to court to get authority to sign his wife. Had it been done in advance, it would have been automatic, probably cost less than $100. Uh, it's one of those things, you may never need it, but if you ever do, uh, it's protection. So that's what uh, I do, is meet with people, help them get all this together. There's no cost or obligation for meeting with me. If you want to get information, go to your own attorney. You pay whatever their fees are. If you do not have attorneys, I do have through my own uh, system, we can actually do documents for you. Generally, they're about 20 to 50% less than what it would be if you just walk into an attorney. So I'll be at the uh, information desk. Uh, you need to pick up a form, sign up for a time. I'll be available tomorrow afternoon and evening. So if you need to come after work, I'll be here. Uh, but you need to come by and sign up for a time today. Thank you. It's good to be here again. And one final announcement. Um, this Friday is the Teen Youth Rally, and that'll be at Suburban. So if you're interested in going to that, uh, talk to Brother James, and he'll set up so you can go. Uh, at this time, we'll pray for the offering. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, and thank for this time that we can be here in your house and help us to <clears throat> have an open heart. Um, and to have your uh, uh, hand guide us and help us to um, be have our ears open to your word. In Christ's name, amen. Kathy, blessed be the name. Right now, we'll actually have the choir come and sing for us a song entitled, I Know It Was the Blood.
let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to look at one more song this morning. If you take your hymnals, 191. There is power in the blood this morning. 191. Lift it up. We'll do all four verses as the choir and orchestra go down, but this is 191. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power. wonderful singing this morning. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Right now, Renee will come and sing for us, My Redeemer is Faithful and True. i 
Aren't you glad your Redeemer is faithful and true? Ooh, man. If he's not faithful and he's not true, then what's this all about? I'm so glad he's faithful and true and he's living. He's still on the throne. Man, it's a good day to be a Christian. Amen. Uh, just a couple of quick prayer, prayer requests um, that we mentioned in Sunday school, but we did not mention um, in Sunday in the earlier announcements. Continue to be with, um, it's good to see Mr. Salazar back there. It's great to see Mr. Salazar back there. Uh, to continue to uh, be in prayer for him. Uh, be in prayer for Brother Bob Chexer as well, as he's still in um, the hospital. And uh, Brother Greg Johnson, I believe, is still having surgery in the morning. So a lot of people that we need to be praying about. And then also be in prayer for the Soto family. And Tony Soto, as his mom, um, went home to be with the Lord. So just um, continue to be with them. They're going to leave on Wednesday to go down to Puerto Rico. And so just pray that um, Lord just gives the peace that passes all understanding. Amen. And that they give them um, safe direction um, and safety as they go down there. All right, 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter in chapter number 1. Um, I um, appreciate um, the opportunity um, that pastor gives uh, me every, each and every time I preach. Um, I don't take it lightly, and I just um, want to thank him publicly and Mr. Salazar and uh, just everybody for, and the deacons for allowing me the opportunity to preach. I love to preach. I really do. Um, I love to preach to the teenagers, um, and um, so they're an easy group to preach to. And so, um, but um, I'm excited and, and excited for what God has done for us. So Second Peter chapter number one. Excuse me, I said two. Second Peter chapter number one. If you can stand with me, Second Peter chapter number one. Second Peter chapter number one. My seventh and eighth Bible, my seventh and eighth grade Bible class might know this passage of scripture fairly well. Second Peter chapter number one. Let's look at verse number one. Simon Peter a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace, he says, be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Amen that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse number five, and beside this, giving all diligence add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Would the, wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second Peter, Peter is here talking in his second epistle to the people to the Christian Jews that are scattered abroad throughout um, um, Rome and the territories around Rome. In his first, um, his first epistle, he was talking about um, the church and he was talking about um, um, a good Christian life and how you are to, um, to, 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 to act and how you're supposed to do things decently in order and different things like that. Well, Second Peter, he gets after the, um, the church and the people that he's talking to a little bit. No doubt he would have gotten letters back um, or he would have gotten letters from, from the different area churches, um, pastors, and he, they would have been saying, you know, things that are going on and some things that needed help, and they're asking him to strengthen them. You know, give us something, give us an encouragement letter that can help these churches. And so that's what he's doing in Second Peter chapter number 1. Look back at verse number 2. It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God on our Lord Jesus Christ. What I would like to preach about this morning is that very thing, is the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And not just of him, but of our God as well. So let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us um, receive this knowledge of God and that we can better serve him in our daily walk. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and be able to preach and be able to hear preaching. We do pray, God, that you just um, d uh, get away all the distractions, Lord. We, we ask that you bind Satan from this place, that you, um, everyone, up, everyone here will be able to... Um, to listen and to learn and to see, Lord, not what I have for them, but what you have for them um, this morning. We just pray for that. We pray that you'd be with me. Help me be a vessel 
uh, speaking the words that you would only have me to speak. Hide me behind the cross, God, and just give me power from on high. And we thank you so much for all you've done. And we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. There's a central idea of the text. When I was in college um, in homiletics, Brother Sam Davison said this, you always need to figure out what the central idea of the text is. What's the big idea? And I believe that the big idea here in the verse, a couple of, in, this, in this first chapter of 2 Peter is this, the full knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation which Christian character is built and is needful for the defense of our faith. Well, Brother James, this is Sunday morning, of course, of course we need the knowledge of God, but what truly is this knowledge that we're looking at? What is the knowledge of God and why do we need it? Why is it so prevalent? Why do we have to use it? Why do we need it to defend our faith? What's coming at us that we need to defend our faith about? And Christian character, well, I know what character is. You know what, you could be a very good man with high character and still be lost and still not be saved. What does it mean to have Christian character? Early on in my childhood, I came to a very good um, realization. Why do I need to go to school? That's a good question, I thought. I thought it was a great question. It's a thought that I believed I needed to discuss with my parents. Hey, I'm going to go. I, I did some homework. I did some, I don't want to say homework, but I did some studying and all that kind of stuff. And I was, I was prepared, you know. And as, So one day I went to them before going to the junior high school that I attended. Did you get that? Junior high school that I attended. It wasn't college. It wasn't high school. Um, and I asked the question, why do I need to go to school today? Mom, dad, why do I need to go to school today? And I was like, I don't want this. I don't, oh, because I told you so or because it's good for you. No, no, no. Why do I need to go to school today? That's what I wanted to know. And it wasn't because I wanted to get out of school, but I was like, why do I need to go to school? What does this, what does school have to do with anything? What, what's going to happen in my life if I truly know how to diagram a sentence? What, um, what, am I go, what am I going to do? Why do I need to do book reports on these books that are hundreds of, and centuries of years old? Why do I need to make a book report on that? It doesn't make any sense. I'm never going to use this in my life. Um, why do I have to sit through a math class where the teacher is trying to get me to prove that I know the answer? I know that the answer is this, but yet he wants me or she wants me to prove it, Brett, Mr. Tattenen. Why do you expect us to prove our work? That's, this, that's, that's one of the weirdest things. I know the answer. You, you know that I know the answer. Why do I have to prove it? It doesn't mean anything. All right, Miss Reidenauer, I don't think is in here. Where's she at? I don't think she's in here. Why do we have to diagram sentences? That is... I went to uh, Miss, Miss, um, Miss um, Lockett's room, and she had the diagramming. She had the line, and then the line that goes off, and this, and that. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh I just got, I got, I got lightheaded. And I'm like, oh, thank you, God, that pastor doesn't make me do any of that kind of stuff, all right? And so, but anyway, what is the reason? Well, the reason they probably told me was because I said so, boy. Now, get your clothes on. Let's go to bed. Let's go to, let's go to school. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes. Whatever you would want for, sir. Yes, sir, you're good hair today. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, thank you very much, sir. Um, the truth is the reason you go to school and the reason why we push our young people to strive to do better and to go to a good college is because they need the necessary skills in problem solving to survive their adult life. That's the reason why we go to school. Teenagers, that's the why reason you need to go to school. It's not because your parents hate you. It's not because the teachers don't like you. It's not because your parents want to go off and, you know, and have some fun and school is basically a babysitter. No, no, no. We want you to have the necessary skills so that you can function as an adult. We can see people all around, and we know people around us that, have, that, have, that didn't take school seriously or didn't go to college or whatever it might be, and they are still living off their parents or they're still, um, they don't know how to function as an adult. They don't know. It's because us here in America, our um, education and different things that is going on with Common Core and different things like that um, has, has weakened our system. And we have weakened our kids because of this isn't a, an educational message. But that's what, is, has, that's what has happened. That's why we have people that cry and whine because the president that they wanted didn't get elected. And they need time to deal with that. And they need counseling and all that kind of stuff. We would have made, gotten made fun of if we would have done that. Oh my, and my generation's not that old. Some of your guys' generations is a little bit older than mine. Not old, but just older than mine. You guys would have been laughed at. You guys probably would have beaten up the kids that were crying about it. All right? But it's because we have dumbed that down. I believe that's our problem in churches today. 
I believe the problem in churches today and the reason why we're not on fire for God like we should be, why we're not seeing the soul saved like we used to back in the 50s and the 60s and the 40s and the 70s, whatever it might be, the reason why we don't have those type of revivals in our lives today is because we fail to realize and we fail to mention and we fail to receive the knowledge that God has for us in his word. And in 2 Peter, Peter is pleading with these Christian Jews scattered throughout Rome. And he's saying, please listen to what I'm saying. I've already wrote one epistle to you. I'm writing this one again, and I'm gonna get after you on this one. You need to do these things. He wasn't saying this is brand new stuff. He is saying this is stuff that I've already talked about, but I've gotta keep bringing it up because you're not doing it. And so this is what we wanna look at this morning is the knowledge of God. Is the knowledge. In verse number two, he says this, that grace and peace need to be multiplied through the knowledge of God. Peace is always preceded by grace. Peace in the Bible is always preceded by grace. You cannot have that wonderful peace of God that passes all understanding unless you first trust in God's grace. I went to um, um, the, the viewing, I believe, the viewing, yes, on Friday uh, for, for Brother, for brother Lane, Miss, uh, for Miss Mary's um, niece. And it was at a Catholic church. I go in there and you see, um, you know, the crucifix and Jesus hanging on the cross. And I'm just thinking, you know what, man, these people, they don't have any hope. They don't, they just don't realize there's, there's not going to be, whole, you know, Miss Mary, I'm sure had peace. There's some, there might've been other ones there that had peace, but those people that go into those difficult situations, we have a young lady where her, her uncle died this past week. Um, those situations where they don't have that peace. And the reason why they don't have peace is because they don't have grace. And grace is always, always, peace is always preceded by grace. You can't have one without the other. Talked to Brother Tony this morning, went up to him, and my heart is heavy for Brother Tony. Me and, him are, me and him are buds, okay? We used to do a lot of stuff together, golf, landscaping, whatever it might be. And I went to him, I was like, hey, love you, buddy. You know how? And he's like, I'm doing okay. Do you know how Brother Tony's doing okay? It's not because, in, it's because of Miss Brenda. It's not because of us here. It's not, even though that helps, but it's because he has a relationship with Almighty God and God is the only one that can give that peace that passes all understanding. And furthermore, the peace that passes all understanding, you must, you must buy in and you must accept that grace today if you want the knowledge of God. If you want the true knowledge of God, because if you don't understand that grace, and if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and asked him to come into your heart and to save you from your sins, can I tell you, you will never have peace in your life, and you will, it'll be, um, you will be unable to access the knowledge of God that we're about to talk about. So I plead with you. If, you don't, if you're in here and you're not saved, please come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ so that all these things that we talk about, you can buy into. He talks about here in a couple more verses about the precious promises. You cannot receive those precious promises without being saved. So I pleaded with you with that today. So how can we know what the knowledge of God is? What do we need to do as Christians to ensure we have the knowledge that Peter is talking about? Well, what he is saying here is that to understand Christ-like knowledge, we must know Christ. And when I say know Christ, I don't mean at a salvation level. I mean in a relationship level. Salvation is a relationship with God, yes, but once you get saved, you truly get to know something. You truly want to know someone. When I was, in Heart, when I was at Heartland, I had the wonderful opportunity to work at a couple of hotels, nice hotels. The hotel that I worked at last was called the Skirvin Hilton, was the nicest hotel in Oklahoma City. And in one week, we had what was called the Centennial, which was Oklahoma's 100-year anniversary. And in one week, I saw probably, I saw... I don't need to say their names, but I probably will just to name drop. But I saw Reba McIntyre, Carrie Underwood, Johnny Bench, um, uh, Toby, all, I mean, a bunch of Miss Americans. I saw, in that same year, I saw Hillary Clinton. I saw um, 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 George Bush's um, um, military officer, um, Secretary of Defense, Rumsfeld. I saw, all, I used to see all basketball players and this basketball player. I got to see Bobby Knight. I got to see Coach K. All these kinds of stuff. And so I would go to people and I'd be like, hey, I saw... I saw, um, saw Coach K today. Yeah, yeah. Talk, I waved at him, talked to him. Yeah, he went right by me. No, yeah. I mean, by what I said, do I know who Coach K is? No. But do I have a relationship with him? No. But I saw him. I admired him. He was only just a couple of feet from me. I even kind of smiled at him, and he just kept walking. All right? But anyway, and I'm like, hey, we need, I, hey, but do I really know who Coach K is? No, I don't. I don't have a relationship with him. I don't have an intimate relationship with, with anybody that was there. So it is possible 
to like, to like somebody. It's possible to, to, to like what they do. It's possible to buy into what they say and to what they do and to be excited about it without ever truly knowing that person. I believe Paul says it best in Philippians chapter number three, verse 10. He says this, that we may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. So Paul even says, and he backs up Peter and says, we must know who Christ is. That's the ultimate goal, isn't it? To become more and more like him. So in order to be more like him, we must first have the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. Well, brother James, that's pretty simple. You get saved. That's one of the blessings that God gives us is the Holy Spirit to come in and to indwell in us and and to to help us, you know, and to tell us what to do, what's right and what's wrong and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's exactly right. But... If we're not careful, we don't get to enjoy all of the perks and blessings that the Holy Spirit provides for us because of our walk or lack of walk with Almighty God. Um, letter A under the um, Holy Spirit's presence in our life is God has a plan for our life. Verse number three, the Bible says this, according as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain unto life. Can I tell you this, that God in his omnipotence and all of his glory and all of his intellect, he has given us everything that we could ever need to live a life dedicated and devoted to God. He has given us everything. It's all in the Bible. Brother James, you're really, you're preaching to the choir here. I understand, but just stay with me for a little bit. He has given us everything that we could ever, ever want. We do not need to add or take away anything written in the Bible. What God has given to us is perfect and will last forever. Regardless of change in society, regardless of change in culture, regardless of change in man's opinion, any man's opinion, God has given to us everything already. So us knowing that, we should never have to add stuff to our faith. I mean, that's our faith. We should never have to add stuff to the Bible. We should never have to take anything away from the Bible, okay? Martin Luther, back in the time where he was alive, um, he, um, he said this. He, he gave a decree and he said, the book of James should not be in the Bible. It is not inspired of God. He thought that James, the book of James, uh, preaches a works-based salvation. But brother, T, brother Keith preached on it last week. Okay, can I tell you, the book of James is absolutely inspired by Almighty God or it wouldn't be in the Bible. We don't need to add, we don't need to take away anything. A lot of churches today, they're starting to add to what has already worked for us in the, few, in the past. That's why the, that's why the music uh, programs are bigger than the preaching. That's why outreach is going out the window. That's why different things, and they're trying to, um, um, they're trying to access what the world thinks is good and what the world thinks is gonna bring people in without realizing, that the Bible has the answers all along. So when we don't have the Holy Spirit in our life, when we have the Holy Spirit, he gives us a plan for our life and he gives us everything that we could ever need. But there's times in our life that we don't have the Holy Spirit in our life like we should. Ephesians chapter four, verse 29 says this, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that's with, but that which is to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So he says, don't let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. The only thing that can, should come out of your mouth is to uplift and to glorify and to encourage. We understand that. But in the very next verse, it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So basically what that says is this. Basically what that says is this, is... When you have bad communication, young people, when you, when you lie or when you gossip, when you cuss or anything like that, or you're a part of that, what the Bible is saying is that you grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Come here, Dayton. Hurry, hurry. I don't have a lot of time. Hurry, hurry. Come on, come on. You grieve the Holy Spirit of God. The best way of grieving the Holy Spirit or grieving somebody is a football term. Who's ever heard of a stiff arm? <laughs> you stay right there. I got the football, Okay. Okay, the greatest quarterback in all of the world, Peyton Manning, just gave me the ball. Okay, I'm going, you're coming to tackle me, whatever. I stiff arm you. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it that hard. I'm so sorry. I, I did, I did. <laughs> okay, come here. Ready, ready? What am I doing? What am I doing? Come on, 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 come on. 
what am I doing? I'm pushing him away. You can sit down, I'm sorry, bud. I'm pushing him away. Miss Krista, I apologize. Paige, I'm sorry. I'm pushing him away. That's what grieving means. When you allow sin into your life, when you allow corrupt communication like Paul talked about, or any kind of sin for that matter, into your life, we grieve or we keep the Holy Spirit at an arm's length. We push the Holy Spirit away so that he cannot dwell in our lives like he should. So when we do that, we don't have the Holy Spirit always telling us what is right, what is wrong. Because if we live a life that is sinful and full of the flesh, and we allow these things that Paul talks about to infiltrate our life, we keep them. And we sometimes knock knock the Holy Spirit down, no. But we keep them at arm's length. We push them away, push them away, push them away. So you don't always have the Holy Spirit, and you do but he's always not the most prevalent in our life because we feed the flesh more than we feed the spirit. We gotta keep going. Secondly, is God's definition of holiness. I'm sorry, of godliness. If we want the Holy Spirit to rule in our lives, we must live according to God's godliness, according to his godliness, not man's opinion of godliness, not our, even our pastor's opinion of godliness, which our pastor's opinion is God's opinion of godliness, I believe, okay? But not, um, not man's opinion, not our church's opinion, not our government's opinion, not the world's opinion of what godliness, but what of God says. What does he say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Brother Joe? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. To seek his righteousness, seek his kingdom, not the world's kingdom, not, not James King's kingdom, not James's king is righteousness, but God's righteousness. Micah chapter number six, verse eight, he says this, and he has showed the old man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. It's hard to say that, Mr. Salazar, without singing it, all right? But anyway, we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to walk with God. We're supposed to do what he wants us to do. Our opinion doesn't matter when it comes to godliness. It's what the Bible it says it's fact as godliness. The problem we face today in churches today is that we have defined what godliness is. We have watered down and perverted what God expects from his children. Why is it that 30 years ago or 40 years ago, or hey, let's even say this, 15 years ago when I was in high school, that the standards of the public schools or the standards of youth, of youth groups or the standards of even businesses, okay, were high. And they were, they, they, we, want, we wanted to separate ourselves. Why is it now that in today's age that we have perverted and we have watered down what godliness is? That we are accepting things and we are accepting without even knowing it as Christians. We're accepting sin and we're accept, accepting evil things, destruction into our, into our lives without even realizing it because it's been watered down. Because we have churches out there. We have that guy with the really, really nice hair down in Houston that doesn't talk about doctrine. He refuses to preach about doctrine. He refuses to preach about sin. He refuses to preach about the things that are gonna get people mad at him, but he only wants the, the stuff that's gonna make you feel good. And he wants you to bring out that champion and be the best kind of student. That's not found in the Bible. God says this. God said that no matter what, to have godliness, not a form of godliness, but what true godliness is. I think Peter put it best. In his earlier epistle, I think Peter put it best. He said this in verse number one, or chapter number one, be ye holy, why? For I am holy. I don't know how to work this. Okay, anyway, my throat is super dry. There we go. Oh, excuse me. He says this, be holy for I am holy. That's what we need to do. Our our, our definition of godliness should be what God's definition of godliness was. Our definition of holy living and right living isn't what we think it is. It It isn't even what we have taught, we've been taught over the last however many, it's what God explains as holiness, seeking God first. First Timothy chapter number four, verse eight. Let me turn there. I didn't have it memorized, but I forgot it. First Timothy chapter number four, verse eight says this. For bodily exercise profiteth little, amen? That means you don't have to go to the gym, you don't have to run. Josh, Rogers, where you at? I'm sorry, but running, it doesn't profit you anything, okay? Just kidding. Um, 
For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Not some things, not most things, all things, all things. So number one, the Holy Spirit's presence in our life helps us to discern what the knowledge of God is. We're gonna get what the knowledge of God is, okay? We're almost, we're almost there. Number two, our priorities must be in order. In order to receive the knowledge of God, our priorities must be in order. We must give God top priority in our life. Look at verse number five. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue, wait, no, you know, sorry. Verse number five, and beside this, giving all diligence. So before he starts to go on with his list of the things that you need to do, he says this. He says, number one, he says the first thing you should do after you get saved is you need to give God all diligence. Basically what he is saying is this. You need to give God top priority in your life. Amen, brother James. Yes, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Amen, I agree with you, brother. Okay, we don't live it though. I don't live it. I give more time and effort to my wife or I give more time and effort to my, to, I, I call them my kids, <laughs> to my teenagers. I give more time and effort to working a job here at the church, which is good, than I do sometimes my relationship with God. Can you honestly say that the same effort and the same drive and the same action and the same um, intensity level that you give your job every single day at work, you give God the same amount? The same love and attention and desire and, and, again, intensity that you share, you husbands, with your wife, you wife with your husbands, mom, dads with your children, do you give that same intensity and that same love and desire for, for God that you do for them? If the answer is no, then you do, have not been giving God all diligence. You are not giving God top priority in your life. He says this, in order for you to receive what the true knowledge of God is, you must, number one, have the Holy Spirit in your life. Number two, you must give God all diligence. Make him top priority in your life. Pa Peter um, explained it, I'm sorry, um, J. Vernon McGee explained it like this. He said, whenever that his mom or his, or his mom or his wife starts with a big party, his mom would come and make a big announcement. All right, kids. All right, everybody, listen, listen, all hands on deck, okay? We need everybody's help with this. You do this, you clean, the, you clean your room, you clean this, you clean that. Brother JP, you go cut the grass, blah, blah. And you're giving, she's giving jobs to everybody. You guys ever been like that? Giving jobs to everybody. Okay, you do this, make sure you're cleaned up, make sure this, make sure the bathroom looks good. And you're making sure that everything is perfect and you say everybody needs to help. Not, I don't wanna see anybody wasting around. I don't wanna see anybody not doing anything. Everybody needs to help. That's what he said is kind of like with this, giving all diligence. He said, every moment of every day, you were all hands on deck for the things that God wants you to do. When you give God all diligence, you will not miss a day in your Bible reading. When you give God all your diligence, you will not miss a day praying for those that, praying in your prayer life, praying for the ones that are afflicted. When you give God all diligence in your life, you will never, I don't want to say never, but you will hardly hardly give in to Satan's temptations. It isn't conditional. It's not up for debate. God is calling his children out here and he's saying he wants our absolute attention. He says, kind of like what I said last, last Sunday, he said, hey, are you gonna truly follow me or are you gonna follow the world? You can't do both. God is, a, God is a jealous God. God, I mean, this is a bad word to say it, but God's almost like a greedy God. And the fact that he wants his children to love him with all of their heart, their soul, their mind, their strength. He is saying that. He's saying, you guys, I, want, I crave your attention. You moms in here, your dads in here, your kids, you know, if they start to grow up and they're teenagers, and you say something like, oh, they don't need me anymore. I just really wish they loved me like they did when they were a little kid. Okay, you crave that attention. You crave that. God craves that from his little children as well. And if we understood, if we understood how much our parents wanted us to hang out with them when we were, you know, that age, okay, then we would have done it because we don't want to hurt our parents. Furthermore, we need to do that with God. The fact is that most people look at the Christian life as an extracurricular activity. We look at Christian life as an extracurricular, extracurricular activity. God puts us first when he sent his son to die for our sins. The least we can do is put him first in our life. Here's the thing, guys. Church, sorry, I say guys when I talk to them. Um, here's the thing. 
It's not just giving God, God all diligence and then you're done. Paul says it like this. He says, I die daily. He understood that he needed to every single time, every single time he got up and he had his devotions and he prayed that he asked God, God, help me to make you first priority in my life. Help me, God, to when I wake up to think of nothing but you. Help me, Lord, to, be, to, to fall back in love with you each and every day. Let's not make um, the, um, surviving um, or um, walking our relationship with Christ or our Christian life an extracurricular activity. We know what that is, right? Extracurricular is that thing that you do after everything else that you've wanted to do, you've done. God doesn't deserve that. God expects better from us. We should expect better from ourselves. Then we're going to get to it, okay? Give me five minutes, and I'm not going to put a time limit on it. Never mind. Um, Number three, not only do we need the Holy Spirit's presence in our life, not only do our, uh, does our priorities need to be in order, but number three, the adding of more than just faith in our life. The adding of more than just faith in our life. Faith is not enough to know the knowledge of God. <gasps> what do you say? Well, that was really weird. Um, fa- sorry, faith is not enough to know the knowledge of God. Faith absolutely is enough to be saved and to go from going on, for on your way to hell for on your way to heaven. But so many times as Christians, we're okay with that, Brother Joe. We're okay with just, as, as they said, being saved just by fire. We're okay just escaping hell's, hell's death, but we don't push ourselves. We don't expect ourselves. We don't want more out of the relationship with God. We don't want more out of, um, out of our relationship. We're okay with just, I'm going to heaven and I'm okay with going to church every now and then. I'm okay, but I'm not gonna get involved and I'm not gonna do this and I'm not gonna pray and read my Bible like I should just because I don't have time and, you know, and things get in my way and I've got other things that I've got to take care of. I've got to take care of them, all that kind of stuff. Well, no, no, no. The adding of our faith, adding of more than just our faith is key is key when we want the knowledge of God. After we have faith, we know what faith is. He says in verse number, um, verse number five, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Virtue, how Peter used it, is characterized as this, as the very finest of Roman manliness. That's what he means by this. When we think of virtue, we think of, we think of purity, yeah, right? We think of someone that is, you know, we think of a girl or we think of a boy that, that, that has kept themselves, you know, they're, they're very virtuous. You know, even the Bible describes it as, um, in, in Proverbs chapter number 10, verse 31, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The same virtuous that, that, that um, Solomon uses in chapter 31 is not this, and of Proverbs is not the same I said 1031, 3110, is not the same that he uses here. When he says virtue here, he's talking about the very finest of Roman manhood or manliness. Or in another way of putting it, it's courage. It's courage. It's necessary to possess courage in these days to stand up for what is right and to stand when no one else is. It's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do to be the only person at your job or the only person in your family or the only person in the youth group that is standing and is doing what's right because it's so easier just to go with the flow. It's so much easier. It's it's easier to to just, just, just go along with things and just accept your faith and just accept that this is just how it's going to be. But God is saying this. He's saying you need to be courageous in what you do. You need to stand up for what you do. You need to stand up for what is right. You need to stand up for me. I stood for you. Stand up for me. Verse number three, or sorry, number three, it's necessary to possess courage in these days to stand up for what is right. Courage and strength go hand in hand together. You cannot have strength without courage. You can't have courage without strength. You want to be strong in the Lord, young people? You want to be strong and in the power of his might? You need to adopt courage in your life. Young Christian, if you want to be strong in your Bible reading, you want to be strong in your prayer life, you want to be strong in everything that you do and everything that your world encompasses, then you need to have courage in your life. Joshua chapter number one, verse seven says this, only be thou strong and what? Very courageous. Joshua was at a time after Moses dies and Joshua is now the head of the Israelites, the children of Israel. And he is saying, there's gonna be some things coming our way. He said, you know what? The Jordan River is just a couple of days away. He said, Jericho is just a couple of days away. And he says, the only way we're gonna get through this is by having courage and being strong, not in our own strength, not in our own courage, but in this courage and the strength that only God and the Holy Spirit can give. Number two, after virtue is knowledge. The word knowledge in the Greek here is gnosis, meaning super knowledge. 
Now, this isn't the same knowledge that we, see, that we read in verse number two. This is a different knowledge, okay? This is the super knowledge. This is the, this is the same word used in chapter three, verse 18. I should just read my notes. This, the same word is used in chapter three, verse 18, when Peter says this, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It gives the, it gives the, um, it gives the, uh, the picture of, of a tree growing. It gives the picture, and he references John chapter number 15, when he talks about growing, and he talks about how he is the, uh, we, he is the vine and we are the branches. His banner over me is love. You guys know the song? Okay. Um, he is, this is a state of always growing. This is a state of, of always maturing in the Lord. You'll never, like, like what Brother Larry and Brother and Miss... Brother Larry and Miss Mary said this morning, you don't stop. You don't ever arrive in your Christian life. You don't ever arrive in your marriage. You don't ever arrive in your faithfulness of God. There's always time to move. There's always a, a, a time to go up and to mature and to grow in what God has for us. Stay with me, please. I'm, I, pro- I know I'm going a little bit longer, but that's okay, okay? Letter D, after knowledge is temperance. A better term for temperance, or we've always, I've always understood this. Temperance means what? Self-control, right? But Josiah, help me out. What's my definition of temperance? I can't hear you. Control of self. I was talking to Brother Turner about this a couple of years ago. Bruce Turner, he said this, temperance is self-control. He didn't like that definition. I don't like that definition now after talking to him. Because when you have self-control, you're relying on your own self, your own power to control the things that are going around you. We don't have that. God wants us to cast all of our care upon him for he cares for us. God wants us to give complete and utter control over to him. So instead of saying self-control, I like this, being controlled or having control of self. Because when you're control of self, you're allowing God to control those things. And when we do not have control of our emotions, our actions, and our desires, when we lose control in our lives, we allow the sins of laziness Covetousness and covetousness to creep in. When we don't have control and we don't have God's help and God's strength to control our lives and control the things that we do, we, we give into laziness. We give into covetousness. And those are two things in the Bible that God takes very, very seriously. In Proverbs, in Proverbs um, Solomon says this. He says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little of the folding hands to sleep. And then he goes, he says, I went by the field of the slothful. And forever it was, it was, it was covered with thorns and thistles. He says, and, 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 and the, the stuff was laying on the ground. He said, he said, and the man was void of understanding. He was lazy. He didn't want to do it. And when we don't allow God to control our actions, Actions, to control our emotions, young people. When we don't let God to control the things in our lives, then we will give over to those sins of those fleshes, of the flesh. After temperance, or after control of self, we see patience. Patience is key. We've always heard patience is a virtue, right? Well, patience, you know, that's it is a virtue, but patience, I'll tell you what patience is not. Patience is not sitting in traffic and not getting upset that you'll be late to work. Oh, come on, I'm, oh, I'm in all this traffic. God, give me patience. Give me patience. Thank you. I guess I'm going to be late for work. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. All right. I'm glad, I'm glad God gave me patience. Or you have a kid that's running crazy in the nursery. You have a kid that's running crazy at Kids for Christ, or it's your own kid, and you're praying, God, please give me, give me, give me patience with this kid. He just doesn't listen. She just doesn't listen. Give, that's not the patience that we're talking about here. Patient, patience is the endurance. The Sorry. Peter's definition of impatience here is the endurance through trials, is enduring through trials. And this is what he is saying. He is saying that we need to endure in our trials in order to understand the knowledge of God. After patience is godliness, which we've already covered. Next is brotherly kindness. This is the love that we show to our brethren, our Christian brethren. It is important to have love for brethren. When we do, we don't get our feelings hurt, we don't hold grudges, and we will learn to fellowship and eat and be easy to forgive if we truly have a love for the brethren. I wish I could spend more time on that, but I can't. Then lastly, we have charity. This is the love for the unsaved. If God loved them so much to die for them, then we should love them enough to tell them of God's love. This love isn't referring to getting down to the same level as the sinner to win them. This isn't saying that, oh, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna listen to the same music, I'm gonna wear the same clothes, I'm gonna talk the same to try to win them. No, 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 no. He is saying to be a step above them and to be an example of Christ's love and be an example of Christ's godliness to them, but rather love them by bringing them to the gospel. 
All of these are essential to receiving the knowledge of God. One cannot work without the other. You cannot bypass one and hop to another. Mr. T, you teach physics, right? Can I take physics without having algebra one, algebra two, pre-algebra, chemistry? I need all those, right? Would I be lost if I wanted to take physics without chemistry? I'd be lost. You, you can't jump. It's, it's the same way here in our life and what he's talking about. You can't take one of these things out and be okay. You can't put one before the other and be okay. You can't take one out or you can't just hop a step. You must do it. If you want to complete the knowledge of God and you want that completion of God in your life, you must take those all together. Why is this all important? Why can't I just enjoy salvation I have and not worry about the rest? Well, number one is verse number eight, we will become barren or idle. Verse number eight says this, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful. Barren here means to be idle, means to be still in God's work. We need to be fruitful in our work. You know what? You can fake being idle, but Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse one. He said that without charity, he said you are of like a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. On the outside, you look good, but on the inside, you're full of dead man's bones. There's nothing inside. They're barren in their thinking and you cannot be fruitful. Then lastly, and I'm done, 2 Peter chapter number two. 2 Peter chapter number two, verse one. Why is it important to have the knowledge of God? He says in verse, chapter number two, verse one, but there were false prophets among the people. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a time that is absolutely being overrun by the false prophets. Not just, I'm not talking about, you know, the false prophets like, you know, the really bad religions or, or even, you know, the ones that don't call themselves Baptists. I'm even calling Baptists. A couple of weeks ago, Miss Becky talked to me about how there's a Baptist church in New England somewhere. And that's the first Baptist church in the New England area to have co-pastors that are both women that are in a relationship together. They are the first homosexual co-pastors. I didn't say it was just a some church. I said it was a Baptist church. Washington, oh, Washington, it was Washington, D.C. Okay, thank you. It was Washington, D.C. Hey, there's false preachers. There's false teachers everywhere. And if we are not careful, and if we don't do these things, because I guarantee you if, you, if you add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge patience, and to patience godliness, and to patience, I know I'm getting those mixed up, but if you do that, you will receive the knowledge of God that he wants for you. The Holy Spirit will make it abundantly clear in your life. The knowledge of God is basically this, to be like God, but you can't take one without having the other. You must incorporate all these things. Why? It's because we don't want to be fruitful, and we don't want to be idle, but, but secondly, it's because we want to not be confused. We don't want to be turned away by these false teachers and false prophets. Better said, the, va- the fate of true Christianity is in our hands. The fate of true Christianity is in our hands. We need to be living a life that is um, relative of that. So let me ask you this question. Do you have the knowledge of God? Are you satisfied just going with the flow and not really amounting to anything in your relationship with God? Or, do you, or does, your, does your life influence others? Are you helping to get the word of God out to the lost and dying world? Do you really know him today? If you don't, I, I'm, and I'm sorry I went long. I really, really am sorry that I went long. But if you are, if, if you don't really know him, first and foremost, if you don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior, I, I pray that when we give this invitation that you come to the altar and you get saved. But if you don't know him on a spiritual and intimate level like you should, if you're not growing in the grace, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not giving all diligence to God, then I pray that you come down to this altar and you get those things right with God so that you can start experiencing that he says in verse number three, I'm sorry, verse number three, he talks about, I'm in the wrong chapter. Verse number three, he talks about, I'm sorry, verse number four, the great and precious promises. Not only do we get to stay away from the bad things, but God will give us good things if we understand the knowledge and follow after the knowledge of God. Let's every, everybody, every, head, every head bowed, every eye closed, and let's go ahead and stand for um, our invitation. Our grace, Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for all you've done for us. God, forgive us for, um, forgive me, Lord, for going over and for, and for taking more time than I should. But I, I pray, God, that you just help the Lord to be a blessing and a help to the ones that are here. God, thank you so much for showing this to me. Thank you so much, God, for, for, for showing God in the, what, what true um, knowledge of God is. 
God, I'm sorry for the times I didn't give you all diligence. I didn't give you a top priority in my life. Help me, Lord, to give you top priority in, in, in my life. Help me, Lord. Help us, Lord, as Christians to give you top priority, Lord, and then to add to our faith all of these things that we've talked about, the virtue, the knowledge, the patience, the brotherly, the brotherly love, the kindness, the charity. Help us, Lord, do that. And if there's one here, God, that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that doesn't know you like, like they should, they can't call upon you and ask you for help in this time, God, that you help them come to get saved today. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen. Page 367 this morning. Page 367, wherever he leads, I'll go. Page 367, if you can't truly say that, wherever he leads, that means that you're giving up everything and you'll go where he wants you to go. If you can't say that today, don't sing. But if you can, praise the Lord. Page 367, wherever he leads, I'll go. Take up thy cross and fall. Are you giving him top priority in your life? Are you giving him all diligence? Is it all to God? If not, you need to come this morning and get that right with God and tell him that you want him to be priority in your life. Are you adding to your faith these things that we talked about? Are you skipping over those things? This last verse is for you if you need to come get things right with God. Or maybe, maybe you are, you do know the knowledge of God. Maybe you just need to come and just praise him and thank him that, he given you, that he's given you the knowledge of God. so much for being with us today. Again, be in prayer for the ones that, um, that, need, that need the prayer. Uh, continue to pray for Mr. Salazar and for Pastor and Wilma and then the Sotos. Um, they'll be very, very grateful for that. Be, be, uh, be back tonight. The teens are taking over the service tonight. I'm even trying to get one of my teenagers to, um, to lead the singing. And so hopefully he'll do that, all right? So come back tonight. We'll have um, maybe a couple of testimonies from what happened at winter camp. We have a um, um, some preachers and some singing. So please come, and I guarantee it'll be a blessing to your heart. Um, parents, don't forget, right after that, we do have a snack attack until 9 o'clock, all right? Well, thank you guys very much for coming here. I'm going to ask Brother Brent to come on up and to dismiss us in prayer. Heard our God, we do pray that we would desire and gain the knowledge of God to apply to our lives and be the servants that you'd have us to be. And as we walk out these doors, we will see it as a field ripe for the harvest and you'll be blessed and honored by our service to you and souls will be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.